good morning and a very warm welcome to our online service from St Luke's in Crosby. I'm Margaret Quayle and I'm one of the retired clergy here. Whether you're a regular attendant at our online services or joining us for the first time, it's lovely that we can share this time together as we worship the God who is not bound by time or place or pandemic. We're currently having a ser sermon series on miracles and this week our theme is Miracles at a Distance. So let's have a few moments silence as we leave behind any busyness in our lives and prepare to come before our Father God who is already with us. We are all welcome as we share this time together. God is with us and his spirit draws us closer. So we begin by lighting a candle to remind us that the light of Christ is always in our lives. So we have the collect for today. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we might, may find true life in Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. We will now have our first song, followed by the reading, which today is from John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 46 to 54, and is brought to us by Jess Stent. The talk will then follow by Chris Parsons. reading is from the um, NIV. It is John chapter 4 verse 46 to 54. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus as his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realised this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. 
Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the miracles of Jesus. This morning, I'll be talking about how Jesus healed the son of an official, not face to face, but at a distance. In this series of talks, we've been using Mark Batterson's book called The Grave Robber. John, in his gospel, does not call the interventions of Jesus in people's lives miracles. He calls them signs. So the first half of John's gospel, depicting the divine acts of Jesus, is sometimes called the book of signs. A point of note is that sign is part of the word significance. So the acts of Jesus are not just amazing miracles, but signs which reveal the significance of Jesus. First of these signs was turning water into wine in Cana, Galilee. Graham preached on this a few weeks ago, and this miracle showed that God is not only the God of chemistry, but is the master of every other scientificology. We must remember that a sign is not the end in itself, but it's often a means to an end. In the case of Jesus, the end is the miracle of bringing people to faith in who he is, Son of God. When we preach, everything that we do or say is pointing to something much greater. The whole point of a sermon is that it is the means by which we try to point people to Jesus. For it's Jesus who brings the life of God into every situation. In our Bible reading today, we find that Jesus has returned to Cana of Galilee from Samaria. A royal official from Capernaum had heard that Jesus was in Cana. And this man was probably a servant, military or otherwise, of either the emperor or Herod Antipas, who was the king of Galilee. This official could have been a Gentile, but we can't be sure. But what we can be sure of is that his son was very sick and just about to die. Jesus was a bit suspicious of the Galileans. They had seen all the things that he had done in, in Jerusalem during the festival. But they'd been there. But the imperious urgency of this official perhaps needed to be checked. Jesus needed to show that he was not just a benevolent physician at the beck and call of anyone who wanted to use his powers as a desperate resource. He said to the royal official, unless you see miraculous signs and wonders, you won't believe. He felt that the faith was shallow. They wanted to see signs, but not the miracle of faith that Jesus wanted them to have. This man was desperate. The route from Capernaum to Cana was a 20 mile uphill walk. No doubt he was walking at some speed. He'd gone out of his way to get help from Jesus. And Jesus showed compassion and yielded to the desperate tones of an extremely worried father. As he pleaded with Jesus to go with him quickly, he said, Lord, come before my son dies. Jesus said, go home, your son lives. The man believed the word of Jesus and set off for home. He didn't insist that Jesus went with him. It clearly indicates that his faith didn't happen because he saw a sign. He believed in the word of Jesus. On his way home, he met his servants and they said, your son lives. They told him that the fever had left the boy at the seventh hour. This would have been one o'clock in the afternoon. And the official realized that that was the exact time that Jesus had said, your son lives. As a result of this, that man came to faith and the whole of his household with him came to faith. This was the second time that Jesus had signaled his arrival in Galilee by the performance of a conspicuous miracle. 
because the official had a high position in society, he would have let it be known that Jesus had healed his son. This would contribute to the enthusiastic welcome that Jesus received in Galilee. Some things we never forget in our lives, and especially the miracles that happen. We all get times in our lives when our faith weakens. At these times, we need to go back to the great things that God has done in our lives. The one event in my life that I will never forget. I was on holiday climbing in Sligacan on the Isle of Skye. I was walking with a friend in a particularly marshy area. And I noticed two people walking across a, a muddy patch in front of me and they walked on. So I followed in their footprints. And in a second, I ended up to my neck in the bog. And I could feel that I was being pulled under. Um, I had my quite a heavy backpack on my back strapped to my abdomen. I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't push with my legs because there was nothing to push against. But there was a witness on the bank and uh, couldn't do anything for fear of ending up in, in the bog with me. And the witness said that all of a sudden she saw me just rise out of the bog and land on my front um, on the bank. So I must have torsion and twisted to be going in the opposite direction that I had been going. And um, my haversack was completely untouched, it was dry. And I just got on with it, went back to the hotel, cleaned up, um, after looking a bit like a bog monster. Uh, and th the next day I climbed in the quirangs, which isn't an easy climb. And went home and a little while later, I was on the floor looking at some paperwork, twisted and sneezed and was in agony and ended up in hospital and I had fractured the front of my pelvis in two parts. Um, but the strength of my muscle after the event in the bog must have held things together until I twisted and sneezed. And I still, I still get pain from that occasionally but when I get pain I thank God for my life because I could so easily have died at that point. Sometimes Batterson puts it in his book, we need to go back to the burning bush experiences in our life. So what can we learn from the passage in the Bible? The first thing is, if you want to experience a miracle, you sometimes have to go out of your way. Go the extra mile as the official had to do in order to get Jesus' attention. The second is that we have to get in close pro proximity to the healing power of Jesus through his spirit by prayer. The third thing is that we have to have faith that it can happen. Some miracles take time or can happen in stages. So don't settle for half a miracle keep on praying again and again. When you experience a miracle for yourself or for others, don't forget to give thanks and praise to God who work that miracle through his Holy Spirit. We've been looking at miracles that happened at the beginning of the first century AD. The power of God that was able to achieve miracles then is the same power that's able to produce them today. It's just possible that our lack of faith, belief, or persistence in prayer could block a wonderful thing that God wants to do in your life or the life of someone else. So keep believing, keep praying. Amen. At many times, all of us do things which we regret and which bring pain to God. So we come now to our time of confession if we say sorry for those things. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins. 
for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For ignoring your call to love you with our whole being and our neighbour as ourselves. Father, forgive us, save us and help us for failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we come to a time when we declare our faith in God. I believe in God, the Father of all, the creator of the universe, who spoke, let there be light, and there was light setting in motion all of creation and blessing it to this day. I believe in Jesus Christ, the light that shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it. He embodied humanity in the image of God and suffered for the greater good. He atoned for our sins and died on the cross for us. God's saving grace. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the guiding light of God in our world. Through his spirit, God conquers the darkness of human sin, helps people grow and become the people they are meant to be. I believe in the power of transformation here in this world and in the world to come. Amen. We will now have our prayers led by Hugh Hollinghurst. Seventy-seven years ago, on this very day, at this very hour, at this very minute, a desperate battle was being fought on the beaches of Normandy after the D-Day landings. The sacrifice of lives lost then ensured that we are free to worship and pray as we do now. Dear Lord, may the memory of two world wars strengthen our efforts for peace. May the memory of those who died inspire our service to the living. And may the memory of past destruction move us to build for the future. In the destruction of war and its aftermath, we hear the cries of orphaned children and laments of bereaved parents. We feel the desperation of those searching for loved ones we see the devastation and we are overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. Comfort and heal the injured, the traumatized, the bereaved and the lost. Lord God, no one is a stranger to you and no one is ever far from your loving care. In your kindness, watch over refugees and victims of war those who have been rendered homeless by war, those who have been forced to leave home and suffer in the open, those separated from their loved ones, young people who are lost. Bring them back safely to the place where they long to be. We pray for healing for those who have experienced trauma due to conflict and violence. Help us always to show your kindness to strangers and all in need. O oh God, the creator of all life, we bring before you the plight of those countries where there are ongoing conflicts, including the Tigray region of Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Yemen, 
Myanmar, the Middle East, South Sudan, and especially all the people who call Israel and Palestine home. We particularly remember those living in Jerusalem and Gaza, whose lives are marred by restrictions to their freedom, the threat of eviction from their homes, and the constant fear of armed con conflict. We ask your forgiveness for the anger, hatred and violence that all of us have the potential to carry within us. We beseech you to soften hearts and open minds so that the sanctity of life is always protected, the right to freedom of worship upheld and the security of a safe home defended. We pray that justice will flow like rivers, that human dignity will be respected and that each one of us may strive to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Dear Lord, guide with your pure and peaceable wisdom those in authority who are trying at this time to bring peace between the nations of the world, that faith may prevail over fear, righteousness over force, truth over the lie, and love and concord over everything. We pray for our armed forces as they risk their lives to preserve peace here and throughout the world. We pray for the policemen and women of this country. Guide them in carrying out their duties, guard them in danger and relieve their monotonous hours of work. May we serve them as they serve us. Hasten a time when crime, dishonesty and carelessness will be abolished and people live together in peace, love and consideration for each other. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Overflowing God, breathe the spirit of Jesus into us and into all those who long for peace, especially those who have drifted from your way, got stuck in their faith or who have not yet found a way to believe you believe in them. Renew them by your spirit so your church may be filled with joy. Help us not only to pray for the peace of the world but to seek it in our lives here. Give us the will and the strength to work for the good of all so that we may act in harmony, live at peace and unite to serve you. Teach us to live at peace with one another and to love even those who seem to be our enemies. May truth and justice rule our homes, our country and our world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now we come to a time of sharing the peace with each other. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. May the peace of Christ fill you this day. Christ is the source of our joy and gladness. We will now have our final song. God forgave my sin. In Jesus' name, I've been born again. In Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, 
So thank you for joining us this morning. We hope that you've found it a blessed time of love, of the love of God. And as we go on our way, we have a blessing. So the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The love of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and all whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, we will. Just a few notices this morning. The PCC has now agreed that up to 45 people can meet for services in church. And as government guidance has changed, if you wish to come as a group of more than three and up to a maximum of six, then please contact the office no later than 10 a.m. on Friday. Groups of three or less, please continue to register online as you have been. And this evening at 7 p.m., we will be having uh, an online eco-service where we will be marking World Environment Day. And members of St. Luke's and the Deanery will be taking part in this service of contemporary music, prayers and short reflections. On Monday the 14th of June at half past seven, we're having another history evening where Hugh will be presenting an evening journey on the overhead railway. Uh, where he'll be looking at the history of places and buildings that you would have seen from the railway. And our mission focus for June is Arosha. So on Monday the 28th of June, we'll be having an evening hearing from Colin Jackson from Kenya about the work that is happening there at the moment. So if you'd like to come to any of these events, please use the link below and book into them. <laughs>